Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are on the fifth chapter and uh, fourth paragraph. This is 26th episode, very special one, where Sri Aurobindo is bringing in Tantra. Before we start, let's recall what we covered in the last episode where Sri Aurobindo touched upon the need to touch upon one central principle common to all the schools, even if each school has its own central principle, what is the common central principles and what is the common dynamic force that is the secret of their effectiveness. If we can know that, then we have a natural reference point to make the right selection of various principles in right proportion and in the right place. So that's, that was the basic uh, view. And also the synthesis will not be accomplished by combining things in mass or practicing in succession. It is only by going into the essential central principles and the dynamic force. Now comes Tantra. We observe first that there still exists in India a remarkable yogic system. So he's seeing it as a very, very remarkable yogic system, which is in its very nature synthetical. So this is a yogic school that is very synthetic in its nature. It has already synthesized and starts from a great central principle of nature a great dynamic force of nature. So its very starting point is a central principle of nature, not specialization of this or that part of our being, but one common central dynamic force of nature. But it is a yoga apart, not a synthesis of other schools. So it stands apart. That's the reason why he did not bring in Tantra in the previous five schools that he touched upon. Because this really, really stands apart. And uh, by synthesizing the five that we saw, we will not reach Tantra. So here is the mystery of it. Here is a school that is very, very different. This system is the way of the Tantra. Owing to certain of its developments, Tantra has fallen into discredit with those who are not Tantrics. So, Tantra in India has fallen into certain kind of discredit. Remember, he is writing these things in the last century, more than a hundred years ago. In today's world, Tantra has gone everywhere it has come back. But more than 100 years ago, Tantra was still very much limited to small schools because there was certain discrediting of Tantra that happened in India because of certain way the Tantra was practiced. So he's hinting at that. Owing to certain of its developments, Tantra has fallen into discredit with those who are not Tantrics. Tantric is the one who practice Tantra. So those who, there was a discredit with those who are not Tantrics. And especially owing to the development of its left hand path, the Vama Marga, which not content with exceeding the duality of virtue and sin, and instead of replacing them by spontaneous rightness of action, seemed at times to make a method of self-indulgence, a method of unrestrained social immorality. So in Tantra, there was a branch called left hand path, Vama Marga in Sanskrit. This particular school of yoga went to an extreme where it was trying to deal with the duality of life. 
the right and wrong, pleasure and pain, and the virtue and sin. Most yogic schools look at how to become virtuous, how to purify. Whereas in this school, they wanted to go beyond the duality. So they are not content with exceeding the duality of virtue and sin. And instead of replacing them by spontaneous rightness of action, so one can go beyond the duality and bring in a spontaneous right action, particularly when you have grown inwardly and established in the divine consciousness, the duality ends, the virtue and sin ends. That's where a realized master's action may perplex an average soul because you cannot understand from the conventional morality, conventional ethics, conventional sense of virtue and sin, a master may seem to be doing things that are inappropriate. But that is possible only for someone who is realized in the inner consciousness. That is a possibility. And that is where it becomes a spontaneous rightness of action. Instead of doing that, it seems sometimes to make a method of self-indulgence, a method of unrestrained social immorality. So in Vama Marga, the intoxicants, sex, meat, all these were part of the ritualistic practice of conquering one's limitations and going beyond the limitations. So in the process of utilizing all these extreme methods, what happened is certain indulgence in these approaches. Instead of transcending actually the duality, you use that as an excuse to indulge, to make a method of indulgence, a method of unrestrained social immorality. One of the practices that are done in cremation grounds and things go to quite some extreme where you get lost in the methods and instead of arriving at that deeper realization, you get lost in the indulgence of the modalities, the methods that were used. So the developments of its left-hand path, the Vama Marga, which is not content with exceeding the duality of virtue and sin, and instead of replacing them by spontaneous rightness of action, seemed sometimes, so he's not saying always, sometimes this has happened, seemed sometimes, to make a method of self-indulgence, a method of unrestrained social immorality. Nevertheless, in its origin, Tantra was a great and puissant system founded upon ideas which were at least partially true. In spite of all this excess that you may find, in its origin, Tantra was a powerful system with its core principles at least partially true. So Tantra was a great and puissant system, a powerful system founded upon ideas which were at least partially true. Even its twofold division into the right hand and left hand paths, Dakshina Marga and Vama Marga started from a certain profound perception. So in Tantra, there are two major branches, Vama Marga, the right hand path, and no, Dakshina Marga, the right hand path, and the Vama Marga, the left hand path. This 
separation itself is based on a, on a deeper truth of our nature. In the ancient symbolic sense of the words Dakshina and Vama, it was the distinction between the way of knowledge and the way of Ananda. So there is the path of knowledge and path of Ananda, the delight. So one group of people took the path of Ananda. That is where the utilization of sexual aspects, the intoxicants, indulgence in the meat, all that were used as part of the ritualistic methods of transcending the duality. The senses were not denied at all. Senses were used to enter into the very material dimension and the most difficult to conquer dimensions. And through that mastering oneself, at least in its intention, that's where the Vama Marga come in, where it is also the path of Ananda. Then there is the Dakshina Marga, that is the right hand path, where it is the knowledge that is largely used and occult knowledge. So in India, even today, when we look at in temples, the chief priests who are doing the rituals are known as also Tantris. Tantri is someone who practices Tantra, someone who knows Tantra. But they are largely the Dakshina Marga, where knowledge of the deities and the Shastra's descriptions about various possibilities of occult knowledge. And holding that power within the temple structures. Temple structures were really the yantras in the large form where the divine powers were invoked and established and held so that the larger society can come in and re-harmonize their internal turbulence by coming in touch with these higher forces established through the system of deities and the worships and they were not just blind belief and unconscious rituals. There was a science behind it. There's a whole body of knowledge, occult knowledge of the tantrics. So therefore a tantri was somebody who knows this and embodies that knowledge and knows the subtle forces of nature not just material forces of nature, but occult forces of nature and the devatas behind these forces and the entire science. India has a vast body of knowledge in this. But also, unfortunately, you know, all power get misused. So we will also see in India the black magic, the black side of things where the occult science is used to harm people to attack your enemies and all kinds of things were done. Instead of discovering the divine and uniting with the divine, powers were used or rather misused for wrong purposes. And it can be in both left hand, right hand, wherever this misuse, because Tantra is also technically means technology, technique. And it deals with the forces of nature and technology can be misused. Even modern science and technology can be misused the same way. Tantrics were the one who harvested the powers of nature and it was so successful all the religions adopted. Buddhism adopted Tantra, Hinduism adopted Tantra. So there is Tantric Buddhism, Tantric Hinduism and every other forms adopted because they were so powerfully successful in harnessing the powers of nature, but using occult sciences, not the material science as we know it. There is occult science that was used by Tantra in harnessing the powers and temple structures and complexes. 
emerged during the Tantric period of India. And Tantra was, was also in parallel with Puranic period, Purana or Tantric period, where on one hand there was a devotion that was brought to the collective society where emotions were turned towards the divine, where deity worship became the central approach. And in building of the temples, Tantra was very central and maintaining of the deities. So Tantrics as the priests became very central in society. So the distinction between the way of knowledge and the way of Ananda now, what are these two? Nature in man liberating itself by right discrimination, right discrimination in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentialities. That is the way of knowledge. Nature in man liberating itself by right discrimination in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentiality. And nature in man liberating itself by joyous acceptance in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentialities. That is the path of Ananda, where joyous acceptance of all the energies that are operational in man, everything was taken up and joyously accepted and pushed their limits to go beyond and touch upon the divine ranges. So let's read the full line. In the ancient symbolic sense of the words Dakshina and Vama, it was the distinction between the way of knowledge and the way of Ananda, nature in man liberating itself by right discrimination in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentialities and nature in man liberating itself by joyous acceptance in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentialities. So these two schools approach in two different ways. But in both paths there was in the end an obscuration of principles and deformation of symbols and a fall. So both Vama Marga and Dakshina Marga had a fall because there was a distortion of the symbols and a loss of fundamental principles and a great deal of misuse. That's where the dark side of destructive side of Tantra came in and harming people using the technology that was available through Tantra. Therefore, Tantra fell into discredit and fear of the Tantrics. So that strong emotion in the collective space still exists. And, uh, but in its essence, original knowledge, Tantra was a great synthesis. This is what is important for us to remember. Tantra was a synthesized system and using a great central principle of nature. If, however, we leave aside here also the actual methods and practices and seek for the central principle, we find first that Tantra expressly differentiates itself from the Vedic methods of yoga. So he is bringing in the notion of Vedic methods of yoga. The last five schools that we looked at, the Hatha Yogic, the Raj Yogic, the Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, they are all, he's grouping them as a Vedic schools of yoga and Tantra differentiates itself from these schools. And he is also inviting us to strip out all the externalities just like other five schools, we stripped off all the externalities. So in Tantra, you will find the yantras and mantras and whole set of ritualistic way of utilizing the yantra and tan mantra and practices built around it. And 
a large variety of yantras corresponding to different deities. So it's a vast body of knowledge. There is no need to go into each and every yantra and each and every bija mantra. None of that is required. He says, let's strip out all the externalities and the details. So if, however, we leave aside here also the actual methods and practices and seek for the central principle. So we need to find the central principle behind all the yantras, all the mantras, all the rituals, what is the central principles? All the rituals, whether it is of Vama Marga or Dakshina Marga, what is the central principle? We find first that Tantra expressly differentiates itself from the Vedic methods of yoga. So first he is saying it differentiates from the Vedic methods of yoga. But what is the difference? In a sense, all the schools we have hitherto examined are Vedantic in their principle. So Vedanta, which is the end of Veda, a culmination of Veda, a flowering of Veda. So he's saying all the schools that we examined so far are Vedantic in their nature. Why Vedantic? What is the essence of Vedanta? Their force is in knowledge, their method is in knowledge, though it is not always discernment by the intellect. So, knowledge is the central dimension of Vedanta, but it's not necessary that knowledge is coming through intellect. One can have knowledge through other means, even heart has its way of knowing, the will has its way of knowing, the subtle body has its way of knowing, even the physical body has its way of knowing. So, though not always dis discernment by the intellect, but maybe instead of the knowledge by the heart expressed in love and faith or knowledge in the will working out through action. So the knowledge can be arrived at through action, through love and devotion and the faith or the discriminative intellect. So these are all part of Vedantic approach. And uh, all the schools eventually seek the knowledge of the divine. Knowledge is their means, their force is in knowledge, their method is knowledge, though not always the discernment by the intellect. They are all Vedantic in principle. All of them, the Lord of the Yoga is the Purusha, the conscious soul that knows, observes, attracts, governs. So here is the central key to all the five schools. All of them, the Lord of the Yoga is the Purusha. Purusha is the being the master, the conscious soul that knows, observes, attracts, governs, the supreme self, whether you refer to that as Brahman or any other word, whether it is referred to as a Purushottama or Paramapurusha, Parameshwara, whatever be the vocabulary that you use, is referring to that Lord of Yoga is the Purusha. In all of them, the Lord of the Yoga is the Purusha, the conscious soul that knows, observes, attracts, governs. So that presides over the universe, that knows, attracts, governs, observes, all that is done by the master of yoga. That's one side of the truth. But in Tantra, it is rather Prakriti, the nature soul, the energy, the will in power, executive in the universe. This is the other side. So remember, in India, we had this distinction between Purusha and Prakriti. It is this vocabulary primarily coming from the Sankhya school of yoga. 
and in the original veda it is nr and nri later in the sankhya become purusha and prakriti and uh, so that prakriti the in prakriti too there is nature soul in the lord in the purusha he is referring to as the conscious soul who observes the witness part of us experientially even if we have not realized the divine consciousness within us there is a pure observer pure awareness pure being that is the purusha the witnessing part the observing part and it is in search of that and discovering its universality and its transcendence that had been the central reference for all these schools that we looked at all the vedantic schools discerning to discover this pure awareness pure self untouched by everything eventually transcends even the universe so that is purusha on the other side is the prakriti the dynamic side force in action that is what he is saying the energy the will in power executive in the universe there is an executive force whether you like it or not everything in nature is moving there is a dynamic energy that is moving the atoms and molecules and organs and nervous systems and movements of thoughts emotions everything internally emotions and thoughts are moving externally the winds and storms all these are moving it's one nature one prakriti one executive force so this is the fundamental polarity of our being on one hand there is the witness poise on the other side there is a dynamic energy that is moving things so tantra uses the dynamic energy whereas the vedantic schools uses the pure witness the purusha the vocabulary may change but qualitatively it is the witness soul the observer the buddhist might speak of the void the pure awareness that is purusha tantrics would speak of this dynamic energy that is in action so in all of them the lord of the yoga is the purusha this is he's referring to vedantic in all of them the lord of the yoga is the purusha the conscious soul that knows observes attracts governs but in tantra it is rather prakriti the nature soul the energy the will in power executive in the universe it was by learning and applying the intimate secrets of this will in power its method its tantra that the tantric yogins pursued the aims of his discipline mastery perfection liberation and beatitude so very much like modern scientists utilizes technology so they intimately study nature and study heat energy and understand the workings of the heat energy and creates a heat engine which can become the animating force that runs a train or they study electricity understand its nuances methods and create a motor that can spin our fans and pump our water and run our ac run even our cars so the same way and that's where scientific knowledge and out of that knowledge comes technology so there is yantra the machines that are coming out of it yantra is also means machine it's the same in tantra there is a tantric body of knowledge tantric techniques they understand they study the executive force in nature but at a subjective domain from that point of view they are discerning the executive force the nature force 
and from there they formulate their machinery, yantra, which includes the mantras and yantras. And you must have seen this geometric diagrams, but that is the blueprint. Activating requires your active participation using the mantras that are corresponding to it and visualization exercises. So you activate the psychological forces using corresponding yantras and mantras and that is the tantra. And therefore every yantra there is its corresponding deity, the devata. So the difference between modern science and tantra is that tantra is dealing with the subtle forces. It is more occult science whereas Modern physics is dealing with the material science and material forces. And material science looks at the forces of nature as mechanical. It's a machinery. That too is true. The hardest part of Prakriti, the material crust, is mechanical. And they are manipulating the forces of nature at a very mechanical level and in a very objective way. In Tantra, they are dealing with the forces of nature at a psychological level. At that level, the forces with whom you can communicate, you can connect with, you can invoke, and you can collaborate, and they can enter you, they can possess you. And uh, these forces of nature become your aids, your collaborators in Tantra. So, it was by learning and applying the intimate secrets of this will in power. Its method, its tantra, the method of will in power. When we say power, we can look at it as a very mechanical outer, like electricity is power. But when we say will, we are referring to something psychological dimension. So there's a will in power, a conscious will in power, a conscious will behind all things conscious will behind forces of nature. From a spiritual point of view, nature is conscious and everything that moves in nature has a will in it, a conscious will in it. So you need to intimately study and understand and connect with it. And there is a mastery of these forces coming with that. So will in power, its method, its tantra, that the tantric yogin, pursued the aims of his discipline. What are the aims of his discipline? Mastery, perfection, liberation, beatitude. Four words, mastery, mastering of the forces of nature, perfection, perfection of its action in the world, liberation, the freedom that comes from that mastery, and beatitude, the beauty, and its corresponding enjoyment, the delight in manifestation, in creation. The Tantric period was also a period of an abundant creation in India, of its opulence and tremendous beatitude. So Tantric yogins pursued the aims of his discipline, mastery, perfection, liberation, beatitude. Instead of drawing back from manifested nature, and its difficulties, he confronted them, seized and conquered. Here is where the Tantrics differs from the Vedantic schools. In Vedantic schools, there is a tendency to say, Prakriti, the nature is Maya. It's an illusion in which you're trapped. You need to step out of it, withdraw from it into the pure awareness, into the pure emptiness, to the pure void, to the pure consciousness, to the pure being whatever be the vocabulary. The nature, these things will come and go. These are transient waves and there is no real deep significance and meaning. You are trapped in it, you need to get out of it. Maya. That is the Vedantic tendency. So even Buddhism is essentially Vedantic in its essence. It is stepping out of the Prakriti, the manifest world, into the pure Purusha, the pure consciousness, pure, vast, unmanifest, eternal, timeless self. Whereas the Tantrics goes, goes other way. They embrace the manifest nature 
and master it because that is the force of prakriti instead of drawing back from manifest nature and its difficulties it is very difficult that precisely is the reason why the vedantic schools withdraw it is tremendously difficult manifest nature and its difficulties he confronted them seized and conquered so the tantrics confronted the forces of nature seized the forces of nature and conquered the forces of nature just like the scientists are conquering the forces of nature but in the end as in the general tendency of prakriti tantric yoga largely lost its principle in its machinery to understand this we can also look at how science and technology creating abundance of technology eventually we get lost in the machinery we originally started off with discovering truth and we discovered a lot of truth about material nature out of that we mastered the forces of nature and we created abundance of technology and now technology has become so dependent i mean we become so dependent on technology we get lost in the machinery and maintaining the machinery and slaves of the machinery and eventually we lose even the very purpose with which we started off and this happened to the tantrics they mastered the forces of nature created its science and technology and elaborate technologies based on it technology of consciousness and got lost in its machinery so lost its principle in its machinery and became a thing of formula and occult mechanism so just like in science you may not know the science but you can still operationalize a machinery you just need to know how to operationalize a machinery you need not know the science at all so uh, imagine a civilization eventually lost the science and it has only the machinery left with so in tantra what happened is it's developed a huge body of machinery the subtle machinery of technology of consciousness and it began to forget its original principles original aims original knowledge then you start operationalizing the machinery to get things done and you get lost in the average human need of whether it is harming your enemies and all kinds of stuff that is not much to do with realizing the divine consciousness so it became a thing of formula and occult mechanism still powerful when rightly used machinery they are powerful even if you don't know the science you just need to know how to run a machine you need not know the science behind it the same thing it is still powerful even if you don't know the original science so still powerful when rightly used but fallen from the clarity of their original intention what was the purpose with which the tantric yogins designed the machinery that was forgotten and you got the powerful machinery then in order to operationalize machinery you need not know much of the original knowledge just like the masses use complex machinery they need not know the science at all but masses would use the machinery for their own narrow limited usage because we are still pretty much animals with our instincts of self preservation self conservation and boundary protection all that and driven by fears insecurities so then what we use we use this machinery just like our nuclear bombs and ak47s to attack others the same thing happens with tantric science and technology the occult knowledge occult machinery is used by the lower instincts of human nature because the users need not be aware of the original science and original intention so 
in the end as in the general tendency of prakriti this is a general tendency of prakriti yog tantric yoga largely lost its principle in its machinery and became a thing of formula and occult mechanism and still powerful when rightly used but fallen from the clarity of their original intention that's what happened to tantra we have in the central tantric conception one side of the truth the worship of the energy the shakti as the sole effective force for all attainment so we have tantrics on the one side and vedantic on the other side in tantra it is the worship of energy shakti as the means of all attainment so we have in this central tantric conception one side of the truth the worship of the energy the shakti has in the sole effective force for all attainment in tantra we will see the shakti worship everywhere in tantra it is shakti who is worshiped and shakti is the one who takes you into the higher realms we get the other extreme in vedantic conception of the shakti as the power of, as a power of illusion and in search after the silent inactive purusha as the means of liberation from the deceptions created by the active energy so on the other extreme vedantic schools look at shakti as the power of illusion maya and it creates deceptions and we need to step out of it to come in touch with the inactive purusha consciousness the witness consciousness the pure awareness who liberates us it is that which through its grace liberates us from the entanglement with nature so on one side there is tantra worshiping the nature manifest nature and the powers of nature on the other side vedanta looking at shakti or nature as a power of illusion instead they focus on the purusha who is inactive so the silent inactive purusha that's the very nature of the pure consciousness even when you look deep into yourself into the pure self that is witnessing if you identify with the pure witnessing self you see it is there is stillness in it there is silence in it it is formless thoughts emotions sensations energy all that are outer layers deeper you go you will find the stillness the silence the vastness and out of that you discover the freedom of the purusha so we get the other extreme in the vedantic conception of the shakti as the power of illusion and in the search after the silent inactive purusha as the means of liberation from the deceptions created by the active energy so the manifest world is an active energy and it is weaving the worlds and we get lost in that therefore we need to step out and search for the inactive purusha and establish there for the liberation whereas in tantra you embrace shakti surrender to her and she will take you to the liberation that's the difference now he is bringing in the integral conception but in the integral conception the conscious soul is the lord the nature soul is his executive energy so this is the synthesis the nature and the co- the witness consciousness in nature is referring to as conscious soul and nature soul the observer and observed if i put in the modern vocabulary the witness and that which is witnessed the force that is manifesting and the conscious being that is observing the consciousness that is observing these two things in integral conception these are not two separate 
movements but one thing and the shakti is the executive force of the conscious self in integral conception the conscious soul is the lord the witness self is the lord and the nature soul is his executive energy executive power of that conscious self so shirobindo brings this union in consciousness there are these two aspects to consciousness that is one is the pure awareness other is the force of consciousness that manifests and the force is inherent in consciousness it can be at rest it can be in movement pouring out into manifestation so these two are one and the same but two different poises so that's the central essential synthesis so tantric schools uses the energy the dynamic side the vedantic schools utilizes the purusha the inactive silent self but they can come together in this integral conception where the conscious soul is the lord the nature soul is his executive energy purusha is of the nature of sat the being of conscious existence pure and infinite shakti or prakriti is of the nature of chit it is power of purusha self conscious existence pure and infinite we have two words sat and chit and remember the ancient conception of sat chit ananda sat chit ananda here is sat the pure being is of the nature purusha is of the nature of sat the being of conscious self existence pure and infinite that is conscious self existence pure and infinite shakti or prakriti is of the nature of chit it is the power of purusha self conscious existence pure and infinite so chit has the power in it the power of the purusha self conscious existence pure and infinite both are pure and infinite one is the pure being other is the power of the being that is infinite uh, first is the being that is infinite other is the power of the being that is infinite sat and chit so chit is the shakti or prakriti of prakriti it is of the nature of chit it is the power of the purusha self conscious existence pure and infinite the relation between relation of the two exists between the poles of rest and action so between sat and chit these are the two poles of our being the relationship between the two is of rest and action that is why often in tantric symbolism you will see shiva is really the passive one who is lying and shakti is the one who is dancing the dynamic creative energy and even within our self when we observe experientially the observing self is of stillness vastness silence and there is a manifest nature force that is moving in as thought as emotion as energy but we do not have control over it so it goes all over the place but actually the witness is the master the lord and these two are not separate they are two poises of the same one is the executive force other is the master who is presiding over one being and that being's creative force flowing out into action so that is shiva and shakti or pure sat and chit the relation of the two exists between the poles of rest and action when the energy is absorbed in the bliss of self conscious existence there is rest when the purusha pours itself out in action of its energy there is action creation and the enjoyment of ananda of becoming here shri aurobindo has brought in the third term ananda of becoming so we have 
Sat, Chit, Ananda, together referred to as Satchitananda. So, Sat is the pure existence, self-conscious existence. When that pours out into action, that's where the energy dynamized moving forward into action. When it is absorbed, there is rest and there is rest, blissful rest, as well as a blissful action. When there is this action, creation and enjoyment or ananda of becoming, that's when the manifestation, the play unfolds. There is an ananda of becoming, there is an ananda of being. Both are there. So energy can be at a state of rest or in a state of action. Now, this need not be anything philosophically abstract. Any artist would know. Now, you have wonderful ideas, dreams, dwelling inside. That is still not manifest. It is insight. The pure being is holding as a potentiality. And out of that comes your emotions and flowing out into action through the will. There the manifestation takes place. And there is this static and kinetic poise of the energy, of the Shakti. It is when it becomes kinetic, it becomes the becoming, the ananda of becoming, ananda of manifestation, ananda of play. But both are poises of one conscious existence, which has its poise of pure witnessing, awareness, and from there the dynamic flow of the force into action, the Shakti dimension. So being is at once these two poises, stillness and movement, Shiva and Shakti, if I may use this vocabulary. So the relation of the two exists between the poles of rest and action when the energy is absorbed in the bliss of self-conscious existence, there is rest. When the Purusha pours itself out in the action of its energy, there is action, creation, and the enjoyment or ananda of becoming. But if ananda is the creator and begetter of all becoming, its method is tapas. Very powerful, potent, insightful line. If ananda is the creator and begetter of all becoming, its method is tapas. Two things here. One is the creative movement. The very cause of creation is that very ananda of creation. We play for the joy of playing. An artist creates for the joy of creation. So here is, if ananda is the creator and begetter of all becoming, you become the dance, you become the song, you become the theater, you become the manifest, whatsoever you create, whatever you create, if you build an organization, that is your creation. It is born out of ananda, if it is coming from the deeper depth, provided. So that's very important because if we live on the surface, we may create out of anger, create out of fear, may create out of mental conceptions, but the spirit, as we go deeper into it from deepest depth of our soul, it is the ananda moving out and pouring out into action. When that pours out, we can experience the joy in it. When we come in touch with any works of art, any works, whether it is art or mundane forms of creation, when there is joy gone into it, you can feel the presence of joy in the very form of creation. So, if ananda is the creator and begetter of all becoming, its method is tapas. How does 
that consciousness creates. Its method is tapas. What is tapas? Force of the Purusha's consciousness dwelling upon its own infinite potentiality in existence and producing from it truths of conception or real idea, vijnana, which proceeding from its omniscient and omnipotent self-existence have the surety of their own fulfillment and contain in themselves the nature and law of their own becoming in terms of mind, life and matter. That's a complex statement. The force of Purusha's consciousness. So this pure self-conscious being and it is pouring out its force. So the force of Purusha's consciousness dwelling upon its own infinite potentiality in existence. In the self-conscious existence, you can dwell on its potentiality. What is it that I would like to create? It is latent in the being. In the pure existence, everything is latent. So it, it can dwell on an idea, on that latent potentialities. So dwelling upon its own infinite potentiality in existence and producing from it Truths of conception or real ideas, vijnana. Vijnana is the real idea. Imagine it to be like a seed with its potency to become a tree. So the divine consciousness dwelling upon its own potentialities, out of that potentialities, it creates the seed ideas divine conceptions, truths of conception or real ideas. So in these days we say an idea is the most powerful thing because idea has in it potential to manifest, potentiality. So here Vijnana, which is actually the word for the super mind, which is also referred as the real idea, an idea that is carrying with it the potential power of effective manifestation. Truths of conceptional or real ideas, vijnana, which proceeding from an omniscient and omnipotent self-existence. So this vijnana is proceeding from this truth conception, this seed ideas is proceeding from omniscience. The Satchidananda has its omniscience, omnipotence. So it's proceeding from omniscient and omnipotent self-existence. It is omnipotent and omniscient. Have the surety of their own fulfillment. So once it is set in motion, it is sure that it will unfold and manifest and contain in themselves the nature and law of their own becoming. So the seed idea contains in itself the very law and the very nature of its own becoming in time and space, in terms of mind, life and matter. So the manifestation from Satchidananda through the super mind, this real idea flows out into the mind so the mind gets the concept clear, the clarity of the ideas clear. From there it moves into the life energy with its emotions, dynamic drive, sensations and the form. So in the mind already you begin to see the form that is tending towards manifestation and then the energy moves it forward and materially eventually condenses, and we create it. That's how through the mind, life and matter, eventually things crystallize in the world. So it starts from there. And the tapas is presiding over this movement. Tapas, the very conscious force of the Satchidananda presiding over its potentiality, picking up a truth conception, real idea, and out of its omniscient omnipotence, moving it towards manifestation through life, mind, life and body. That's the flow. 
let's read this very very potent very very important idea if ananda is the creator and begetter of all becoming its method is tapas or force or force of the purusha's consciousness dwelling upon its own infinite potentiality in existence and producing from it truths of conception or real ideas vijnana which proceeding from an omniscient and omnipotent self existence have the surety of their own fulfillment and contain in themselves the nature and the law of their own becoming in terms of mind life and matter the eventual omnipotence of tapas and the infallible fulfillment of the idea are the very foundation of all yoga so here is the kernel of this synthesized understanding being moving towards becoming in that there is this truth conception and eventual omnipotence of tapas and the infallible fulfillment of the idea tapas is where consciousness dwelling on its own latent potentialities that dwelling is the tapas and it out of that gives birth to the ideas the real ideas truth conceptions that has its eventuality it is it must move towards manifestation so the infallible fulfillment of the idea capital i idea are the very foundation of yoga so this is the fundamental process of yoga that dwelling upon the latent potential and giving it form as truth conception real idea when you have the real idea dwelling on it holding it and it has the potency to eventual manifestation that is the central key to yogic transformation liberation whatsoever you are seeking this is the key and it is true even in our mundane life when we create something when we have to create something we dwell on it we conceive it we conceive it is allowed an idea we hold that idea and see it in every detailed nuanced clarity and out of that it moves towards manifestation as an emotion as a will as an energy labor of love that eventually materializes in the material earthly form this is we have inherited a reflection of the original divine creative process in our normal mundane human life it is the same thing at the highest level and it is the same principle applied at the yoga level therefore the synthesis of the static and dynamic is brought together the creator and the created the method by which the creator moves towards creation is tapas consciousness self conscious existence dwelling upon its own potency and out of that bringing the truth conception real ideas which has its eventual manifestation in time and space in man we render these terms by will and faith in terms of psychology in man we render these terms by will and faith a will that is eventually self effective not an ineffective will but a self effective eventually it will yield it is self effective because it is of the substance of knowledge it is knowledge moving towards will and action knowledge becoming force this is also in the mind in the vedic rishi is conceived it as agni the knowledge moving towards force and the will the divine will in action in man we render these terms as will and faith a will that is eventually self effective 
because it is of the substance of knowledge. The very substance of that will is knowledge. If the will is not having the right knowledge, your will cannot be effective. Only when the will is born out of the very substance of knowledge, truth, only then the will become effective. So will that is eventually self-effective because it is of the substance of knowledge. And a faith that is the reflex in the lower consciousness of a truth or real idea yet unrealized in the manifestation. So faith is something that is a reflection in the lower nature of something that is a greater, deeper truth that exists at a higher level. So faith that is a reflex, <clears throat> a faith that is the reflex in the lower consciousness of a truth or real idea, capital I, capital three. It's a truth or real idea, yet unrealized in manifestation. It has not yet manifest, it doesn't exist, but something in you know this is meant to happen, and that is faith. Because something is reflecting in your lower nature of a deep truth, somehow intuitively you know. But it is not yet manifest. Your mind is still trying to get the clarity, but something in you knows. That's the reflection of a deep truth. And that eventually moved towards manifestation. Faith is in things that are yet to come, where you say, it will happen. I know this is going to happen. And that is what faith does. And when you stand on that faith, when you really know somewhere in you, this is bound to happen, then the mind gets clarity and the life energy gets animated. Emotions move and the body moves into action. So the faith acts like a rock foundation for action and will when it is substance of knowledge, true knowledge, then it has this power. So faith and will together moves towards manifestation and that's the key to yoga, faith and this will. Tapas has both of this will and faith in it. So in man, we render these terms by will and faith. A will that is eventually self-effective because it is of the substance of knowledge and a faith that is the reflex in the lower consciousness of a truth or real idea yet unrealized in the manifestation. It is this self-certainty of the idea which is meant by the Gita when it says, Yo yachraddha sa eva sa. In English, whatever is man's faith or the sure idea in him that he becomes. This is a key master clue from the Gita. Yo yachraddha sa eva cha, eva sa. Whatever is man's faith or the sure idea in him that he becomes. And modern psychology is rediscovering this deep truth. It is out of that comes like you must believe in yourself. Now, what is your deepest belief? What is your... People still use the word belief. But here we are also using the word faith. And faith is not a religious belief. We are talking about a deep reflection of a truth in you and knowing that truth. That is the faith and the will in the idea. That sure idea in him. Idea is with capital I. You're sure. The surety of an idea and faith in it together makes this realization possible. When you have the faith in the divine grace, grace can pour into you. So even when you take up various schools of yoga, the teachers would, have, would say, no, you should have faith in this method. It is more than the method, it is the faith that makes things possible. Technique is only the outer form. It is your faith in the technique that actually makes the difference. 
technique is the least important outer element faith and the surety that this will work for me with that wholehearted self-giving to a particular practice makes the practice effective there are people who take up this or that path of yoga and take up this or that practice but they have no faith in it they say i'm testing it out i'm trying it out so you're half-hearted so it is not effective for something to be effective this faith in it this surety of the idea that this will work then it works so that's the key that we need to remember when you are on the path having faith that the divine protection is there divine realization is inevitable the surety of that idea and dwelling on that has its intensity have its intensity that is that will make it inevitable for the realization to come down the line in time and space it will unfold it is to forge this often these days in modern ways you would say create you know affirmations imprinting an idea into the heart so that you begin to hold this is it your life is disintegrating because you may believe that i'm not good enough and world is a difficult place and when you have that kind of a faith and world become a difficult place if you believe that you are if, if your faith says that you are not good enough and that is what you become so that central idea deep within you surety of the deep idea that i am meant for this and it happens so in that there is faith and the will the self certainty of the idea that's the core of this synthesis and all the yogic methods no matter which yogic school you go which method you take end of the day you must have the absolute faith in that path and the will that is dwelling on it with that right knowledge this must be and it will be divine grace will ensure that it will unfold in time and space so that's the central key that he has arrived at by going through all the schools the tantric school the vedantic schools behind all that there are these two the stillness of the purusha and the dynamic energy moving towards manifestation these are two poises of the same thing it is one conscious existence pouring itself into action and creation and the method of that manifestation is tapas and tapas has this will and faith in it self certainty of the idea consciousness dwelling upon its own latent potential and out of that coming the truth conceptions and it has its self self certainty of manifestation and moves towards realization that's the key that's the fundamental truth now he has distilled out and given to us so remember this this union of the two poles stillness and movement of one being and tapas as a means of manifestation surety of the idea faith and the will so with that we have come to the end of this episode please share your insights so that others can learn from your insights and this episode series become a good reference for others to come and learn more from your learnings thank you see you next week